Being married to a school teacher, one thing that I've learned to expect from time to time is that Lisa's going to come home after a long day at school and she's going to say, we had a fire drill today. We had a fire drill. And when she says that, I know exactly what it means, and that's not because I'm a volunteer fireman. That it reminds me how when I was a kid at school, we've done the same things. As much as things change, some things remain the same. So what happens during a fire drill? Well, first, the school bell rings in a distinct pattern, the fire alarm pattern. Second, teachers and students, they're supposed to calmly, yet rapidly, get together, file out of their room. They're supposed to just leave their stuff sitting there. Your stuff isn't important. You are, right? And then third, they are to exit the building by a designated pathway and remain in a safe place until the all-clear signal is given. And then they can re-enter the building. Then, and what I usually hear from Lisa is, can you imagine teaching after a fire alarm goes off? They resume their day, right? Well, like I said, I went through several fire drills in my years from kindergarten all the way up to sixth grade, and we never had a real fire at my school, praise God. But we were at least a little ready for the idea of it. Uh, Lisa has taught several years, and they've never had a fire either. Uh, there was a little smoke one time, I understand. But uh, anyway, uh, why have fire drills? Because one day, one day, the real thing could happen, right? The real thing could happen. And if it does, a lack of preparation would be chaotic and perhaps even deadly. And so, fire drills. Fire drills teach children to expect the unexpected. It teaches them to care for others as much as they care for themselves. It's not about who gets out first, right? And they make sure that everyone knows where to go when the alarm sounds. Because one day the principal may come on the intercom and they may say, teachers, students, this is not a drill. This is the real thing. And at that moment, they'd better know what to do because it'll be too late to teach them then. We're wrapping up our study in the little letter of 2 Peter today. And as we have worked through it over the past several Sundays that I've been with you, Peter, that disciple of Jesus who had been with him from the start, throughout his ministry, who had become a leader of the early church, he knew his time on earth was growing short. God had showed it to him. You're not going to be around much longer, Peter. And he had a concern. He had a concern for those whom he had preached to, he had told the good news of Jesus, and they had opened their hearts to Jesus as their Savior and Lord. He had a concern for them that they would hang on to their faith. They had not physically walked with Jesus as he had done. They hadn't heard his voice. They hadn't witnessed his miracles. They hadn't lived through the crushing disappointment of his crucifixion, nor the incredible euphoria of seeing him alive again from the dead, touching him, eating with him, realizing it is true. Someone conquered death. Jesus did. What would happen to them? when Peter and that first generation were gone. All the people that had seen him with their own eyes, had touched him with their own hands, had heard him with their own ears. How were these people going to keep on? And so Peter wrote this little letter to prepare them, to prepare them for life after Peter was gone. It's an investment. He's thinking ahead. He wants them and, and he wants us. To hold on to our faith no matter what happens. As we've worked our way through this little letter, we've seen a few things. For instance, in the first chapter, we saw a promise and a challenge. The promise was this. God's divine power has given us 
everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Jesus. Everything we need. And then the challenge that he issued at that point was for each of us to make every effort, work at your faith, work at it, so that in order that we can add to the qualities that reflect Jesus' life in us, to add to them qualities that make us more like Jesus, qualities like faith and goodness and knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, mutual affection, Christ-like love. It's all right there in the first chapter of this little letter. To help us fulfill our promise, Peter has encouraged us to trust the Bible, to trust it as more than a collection of stories, more than a history book. It is God's reliable guide for life and beyond this life and on into eternity. Peter has said you can trust it, but he said you got to watch out. There are false teachers. There are people who distort the Word of God. And he's, he's talked about that at a few points. He has then, the, the first part of chapter 3, we saw the last Sunday I was with you, that, that there, we need to learn how to tell time God's way. We need to tell time God's way. We need to be skeptical, first of all, of those people who stand up and say, you know, nothing's changed ever And so, all this God stuff, it's crazy. And he says, oh, wait a minute. They forget that things were once different. And then there was a flood, for instance. And then, of course, Peter is also meaning to say, there was a cross and an empty tomb. Things don't go on the same way forever. God has a special sense of timing. He teaches us. Peter does, to be patient and hopeful as we live our days because God's on his throne. He's in control. And what's more, Jesus isn't done with us. He's coming back. And again, things are going to change in a hurry. We need to tell time God's way. And so we come to the passage we're going to look at this morning. We're in chapter 3 of 2 Peter, beginning with the 10th verse. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. As you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming, That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, Be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Even as Peter counsels us to have patience, he tells us something We must not lose sight of. This is our basic confidence, and that is the day of the Lord. A day or a time period, however exactly we want to understand it, that the world as we know it is going to be upended and even 
wiped clean. It's going to be purified. It's going to be remade. It is surely going to come. It's surely going to happen. And as I told you a few weeks ago, as Peter uh, counseled patience for his readers, I, I seriously doubt that he could have imagined being the man that the Holy Spirit spoke through to even write these words. I don't think Peter could have really conceived that almost 2,000 years later, we'd be reading his words and saying, ain't happened yet. But here we are. And while it might have been beyond Peter's imagination, we shouldn't think that it's beyond God's plan. Peter hinted at that in verses 8 and 9. Read that here on the screen. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Such a delay might have been more than Peter could imagine, but it was not more than God had planned. God today, when we look and we say, Where are you, Jesus? All we can understand is God is still being patient. God is still allowing the word of the gospel to go all around the world. He is still providing people the opportunity to repent and believe in Jesus. Mind you, this time of opportunity has already come and gone for millions, even billions, who have passed away either choosing to trust in Jesus or turning aside or maybe never hearing. And yet one day, Peter reminds us, this fire alarm, the day of the Lord, it's going to ring for every one of us everywhere. And it's not going to be a drill. It's going to be the real thing. As it says there in verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. With that understood, let's organize Peter's thoughts here in these last few verses. And and I'm going to organize them along three lines. First, Since the day of the Lord is certainly coming, He is urging you and He's urging me to live your days with holy purpose. Live your days with holy purpose. Do you have purpose or do you just get up and it's another day to squander, another day to waste, another day to get through? Look at verse 11. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. As you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming, that day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with His promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. The day of the Lord, you see, is not just about what's going to come to an end. It's more about what's going to come, what's going to replace it. Peter speaks of a new heaven and a new earth. But look, it's going to be the home of righteousness. Guess what? That means no unrighteousness can be there. No unrighteousness can be there. All that is evil will be evicted. It will be judged. It will be destroyed. Look with me at the last chapter of the last book of the Bible. The book of Revelation, chapter 22. And I want to read to you some of the last of what John experiences in this awesome revelation he has in the very throne room of heaven. The first words that I will read are the words of the angel who has led John 
in this vision. And then we will read the words of our Lord himself. First, the angel speaks and says, Then he told me, Do not seal up the words of this prophecy of the scroll, because the time is near. Let the one who does wrong continue to do wrong. Let the vile person continue to be vile. Let the one who does right continue to do right. And let the holy person continue to be holy. And then here are the words of our risen Lord. Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. Wow. It's in the light of this promise, Jesus says, I am coming. In the light of this promise, Peter urges us to live our days with holy purpose. In verse 14, back in 2 Peter 3, we see, So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, you are looking forward to that, right? Since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with Him. We are to seek to be spotless because you've washed your clothes white in the redeeming blood that He shed on the cross. You are to seek to be blameless What does that mean? Well, Paul tells us a little about what that looks like in Philippians chapter 2, beginning in the 12th verse. He writes, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. Blamelessness, as Peter and Paul both speak of it, it's not perfection. It's not perfection. And right there we're supposed to go, whoosh. But it is a change. It is a progression. It is a seeking to follow Jesus with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul, with all our strength. It's setting a new course And where we realize that we're to walk in His ways, not our own. He is to be our Lord, not we ourselves. We are to follow His plans and not the plans of this world around us, no matter how alluring they might be, because in the end there is nothing more important than being, as He said there in 2 Peter 3.14, at peace with God. Nothing more important. That sort of life is ready for the last trumpet to sound, for the dead in Christ to rise, and for those who remain to be gathered up with them as we enter in to his kingdom in its fullness. We are ready for the fire alarm to ring. There's a second thing that we need to see, what Peter emphasizes here. He sounds a note of concern as well. We should also be concerned for others. We should be concerned for others. He already told us in verse 9, we read it a few minutes ago, that God's goal in 
holding off the day of the Lord, if you will, is to give more people the opportunity to repent, to turn to Jesus, to come to salvation. And then in verse 12, we've seen that he tells us that we can speed the day of the Lord's coming. Now, that is an interesting way of putting things. What in the world is God talking about through Peter right there? How can we speed the day of the Lord? Well, the only thing that's holding up the day of the Lord, according to the Scripture, is that His Word goes out to all the nations. That's what's holding it up. God is patient with us, not willing that any should perish. And if we want to speed up His coming, what do we need to do? We need to make sure more people hear, don't we? More people have the opportunity to turn to Jesus. That's, that's the answer. And in just in case we're a little unclear about that, Peter even restates the, the meaning in verse 15. He says, Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. Salvation for more people who have the chance to turn to Jesus. Any school teacher who's worth their salt is going to teach the children in their care to take care of each other as they line up for a fire alarm and exit the building. They're not going to yell, everyone for themselves. They're not going to run out and leave the kids standing there. I imagine Mr. Enos would fire them on the spot if that happened, right? You've got to take care of those kids. And you're teaching the kids to take care of each other. I can imagine, well, I've, I've actually, Lisa's told me because she works with some kids that have some issues, some disabilities, that, that they sort of take care of them, and they make special care. And we need to care for those around us. We need to try and help them be ready for the day of Jesus' return. And you never know where those sorts of things are going to come from. Had a neat experience, a fun experience. It scared G Elisa to death uh, on the first part of our vacation. Um, we, we bought a little car recently. only came with one key. And so I said, I want to get another key for that car before we lose this one somewhere. And so I ordered one through the mail. And you know how cars are today. You can't just go to the store and they can't just cut it and... There you stick it in and start it. you got to program it. And so I started calling around. Well, no one in Victoria could program a key for this sort of car. And so I called around in Corpus Christi, and I found a fellow who said, Yeah, I said, uh, I'm a mobile guy, and I'll meet you anywhere. And so we had talked about meeting. Well, it was one of those days that poured a deluge. And he called me and said, Well, I drowned it out my van. Well, we're already headed to Corpus at that point. He said, I'll tell you what. He called me back later, and he said, uh, I've got a friend of mine that can meet you, and he'll do it. And so I've given him your number, and, and he's going to call you here in a little bit, and, and y'all can set up where to meet. All right, all right, we'll do that. So we're driving around, and this guy calls, and he's got a thick accent. He's sort of hard to understand. And we finally figure out we're going to meet at this Walgreens in that parking lot, and, and we're going to get it done. And so uh, we go, and uh, there's this fellow standing there, and he, he sees the car, and he knows the model of car, so he waves at us to let us know this is he. Well, he's driving this probably about 10-year-old uh, Nissan Altima with peeling paint and paper plates on it. And Lisa goes, oh, I don't like this. <laughs> and I said, you just go into Walgreens, and you shop for a while. We'll deal with this. Well, I keep getting these texts from her, are you okay? Are you alive? <laughs> well, I get to talking with this guy. And I said, what's your name? Well, his name is Samir. He's Middle Eastern. He's Muslim. He goes, I I've got a car lot. It's called Sammy's. Samir, Sammy. I said, okay, yeah, I see that. So he starts asking me questions once he learns that I'm a pastor. And, and, and he starts asking me questions about 
You know, I, I've got these Christian friends, and, you know, I, all these Christian friends, they just do whatever they want, and they just live, and uh, their lives are full of wickedness. I don't, he didn't use that word, but that's what he meant. And they act like it doesn't matter at all. And then he, he proceeded to say, that's not right. That's not right. And I, I had to tell him, no, it isn't right. No, it isn't right. But you've got to understand that Jesus is more than a prophet. And he goes, yeah, we, I, I know you believe that. I, he's, he's the son of God, and he rose from the dead, and he's coming back. And there's going to be a judgment, and it's not something where you've got to keep on with that load of trying to do your works all the way through, and you hope that you've done enough more good than bad, where one of these days you're going to be accepted. But those people are wrong to think that they live that way. I'm still praying for Samir, because his, his life hangs in the balance right now. He thinks it's all up to him, and he's got a bunch of... He's uh, got a bunch of Christians that are making him think that I don't want to be any part of that. Pray for Samir with me. But think about who you're influencing. We need to care about everyone and hope and lead them as best we can to faith. And then the last thing, the last thing and then we're done. Peter reminds us one last time as he closes the letter. Don't be distracted or deceived, but be ready. Don't be distracted or deceived, but be ready. In verses 15 and 16, Peter mentions the familiar name of Paul. We know who Paul is because his letters make up a big part of our New Testament. Paul was a learned fellow, and he used all of his learning in what he writes. Sometimes it's pretty thick. Peter mentions that. Peter says, ignorant and unstable people, they're distorting what Paul wrote, and there's tragic results for themselves and for others. It's destruction. In other words, they missed the forest of salvation and were focusing on the trees. And Peter says, don't get caught up in that. Don't get caught up in that. Much like those scoffers in chapter 3, verse 3, they were mistaken. They were looking to spread their error, to catch other people up in wrong thinking, wrong ideas. You know, we can get caught up in wrong thinking. We can get caught up in wrong ideas. We can get distracted about things that don't matter one whit in the kingdom of God. Don't be distracted or deceived. Be ready. A fire drill is not designed to fill students' minds with fear, but it is intended to instill readiness. And so it is with Peter's words here. He closes in verses 17 and 18. Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. Christ is coming again. So live your days with holy purpose. Christ is coming again. So be concerned for others, for their eternal destiny. You cannot save them, but if they don't hear... They cannot be saved. They need the opportunity to believe. And maybe you're the one that needs to tell someone about Jesus. Jesus is coming again. Don't be distracted. Be ready. You never know when that alarm is going to ring.